Now, I won't lie to you and say that I've grown completely comfortable getting red lights, but I have grown. I mean, everyone's got pet peeves, and one of mine is I just hate being stopped by a red light. It just, I don't know, it just bothers me. And I realize that traffic lights are certainly a necessary thing. I'm thankful for them. Uh, nevertheless, I seem to have a knack for catching them red, and, and it just drives me crazy. Uh, I used to complain about it much more than I do now, not to say that I don't complain about it at all, because I, I still do, but I used to complain about it much more until it dawned on me one day as I'm sitting at a red light, I wonder what would have happened had I made it through this light. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Maybe somewhere down the road is a traffic accident that I avoid being in because I've been stopped by this red light. Maybe, maybe there's a pedestrian running across the street that I would have struck, Lord forbid, if he had not, if he had not stopped me at this, this red light. What if this delay, which so frustrates me in this moment, is protecting me or protecting somebody else? I, I don't know. I can't, I can't see what would have been. I can't ever know for sure, but I do know that God's providential guidance does not always and only consist of those positive things. His providential guidance doesn't always consist in Him saying, yes, go do that, and throwing open a door. Sometimes His providential guidance consists of Him saying, no, don't do that, and of closing a door. Uh, sometimes it involves things like, don't go there. You need to stop now and wait on me. And by this double guidance, by this both saying no and saying go, God leads His people. And that, after all, is what we see in the Scripture today in Acts chapter 16. And so, I'd invite you to open your Bibles to Acts 16. If you're using one of the black Bibles in the pew in front of you, you'll find Acts 16 on page 925. And today we will be looking at verses 6 through 10 of Acts 16. And I want you to recall as you're looking there that, that Paul and Silas and the recently circumcised Timothy had left the city of Lystra. They were revisiting Paul's church plants and telling them about the Jerusalem decree, telling them about the decision that Gentile converts to Christianity had no need to take circumcision upon themselves or to keep the ceremonial law in order to become Christians. And so, in our passage today, Luke describes the Lord's guidance of Paul and his companions as they try to figure out where to go next in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're trying to determine where should we go next and to what people should we go next to tell them about Jesus. And, and Luke describes the Lord's guidance of them, both, both saying no and saying, go. And so, as we read these words, I want you to have this question in mind. How did the Lord guide Paul and his companions? It's a simple question. How did the Lord go about guiding Paul and his companions? And I want you to recognize that in His providence, the Lord said, no, and the Lord also said, go. And it's with that in mind that I'll read from Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 6. And as we read together, Let's remember that this is God's holy word. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. So, if we ask this question, how did the Lord guide Paul and his companions, you see firstly that the Lord said, no, in His providence, the Lord said to them, no. And so, in verse 6, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, the central part of Asia Minor. Remember, they're in, they're in present-day Turkey because they had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Now, there are a number of geographic references here, and for, for most Americans, it's hard to draw up in your mind a picture uh, of a map of Turkey, 
but it's much easier to draw up in your mind a picture of a map of the United States of America. So just imagine that Paul and Silas, or Paul and Barnabas, previously have planted churches uh, more or less in the southeast of Turkey. And so they've planted churches in, in Georgia, running across Alabama, into Tennessee, over into Arkansas, maybe to central Texas, in a string of churches across there. And what they want to do is go to the province that's to the west of Texas, to the southwest of the United States. They want to go to the Four Corners region. And that province in Turkey is called the province of Asia. But they're forbidden to go into the province of Asia, so they're kind of mulling around in the center of, of Turkey because they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go there. Well, how did he forbid them? Maybe general circumstances. Maybe it was something like a red light. The red light forbids them from doing what they wanted to do. But more likely, more likely, it was some kind of direct revelation. Remember that both Paul and Silas were prophets and had prophesied, and the Holy Spirit said no to them. And so, well, what, what do they do? In some way, shape, or form that Luke doesn't tell us, the Holy Spirit revealed to Paul and Silas that you're not supposed to go into the southwest. You're not supposed to go to the Four Corners region. This, this is what you're not supposed to do. So they think, well, well what are we going to do? So they, they make a turn to the north, and they go up through uh, Oklahoma and into Nebraska, and they want to actually head up through Wyoming into to Montana. This is what they're planning to do. When they had come up to Mysia, all the way up in Montana, they attempted to go to, go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. And so, so they're, up in, they're up in Montana, and what they want to do is go from Montana east across North Dakota and across Minnesota and into Wisconsin and, and Michigan. But, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. This is the, the only time in the New Testament that this phrase is used to describe the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus. And you know that we call this the book of Acts or the Acts of the Apostles, but it really records the works of Jesus by His Holy Spirit through the Apostles. Jesus is intimately involved in leading and building and establishing his church. He's the one who said, I will build my church. And so Jesus forbade their proposed course of action, not because their course of action was sinning. What did they want to do? They wanted to go preach the gospel. They wanted to take the word about salvation through Jesus Christ to people who hadn't heard it before. It's a beautiful thing, and it's in line with the will of the Father. But nevertheless, Jesus said, no, that's not where I want you to go. And this is where understanding, again, Proverbs 16, 1 is helpful. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So the Lord said, no. I, I, no, I don't want you to go into the southwest. I don't want you to go to the north and move from the northwest to the northeast across the upper Midwest. That's not what I want you to do. And so instead, in verse 8, they, passing by Mysia, they went down to to Troas. So Troas is a seaport on the extreme northwestern end of Asia Minor, and so they were up in Montana, and instead of heading to the east, they headed, they headed to the west to a seaport on the west coast, uh, to a seaport that was just across the Aegean Sea from Greece. So after planting churches in the southeast all the way across to Texas, they moved up through middle America. They went up to Montana. They wanted to go east. The Holy Spirit said no. They went over, and now they're bumming around in Portland. And they're there, and they don't know where they're supposed to go. And the reason they don't know where they're supposed to go is because the Lord said no. Just no. I don't want, I don't want you to go there. No, I don't want you to go there. And so how did the Lord guide Paul and his companions? Well, the Lord said, no. Now, recently I read an article, and I don't really recall what the article about, was about because the title was so fantastic that all I really remember is the title. And the title of the article was this, quote, things don't go as planned, that is the plan, unquote. Isn't that true? Things don't go as planned, that is the plan. Why? Because... Because sometimes the way the Lord guides us is by saying, no, there was your plan. Okay, there's nothing, nothing necessarily sinful about that plan. There was your plan. My answer to your plan is no. The plan is no. Now, our temptation often is to jump immediately to, how do I figure out God's will for my life? But I think the first application is for you to recognize this. Your God has a plan, 
and your God executes his plan infallibly because your God is in control of everything. Your God is in control of everything. There's nothing that stands outside of his purview. There's nothing that stands outside of his control. Your God is in control. He is in control. We call it providence. And if you want a good, succinct definition of what providence is, the Heidelberg Catechism is very helpful in this regard. It says that providence is the almighty and everywhere present power of God, whereby as with his hand he upholds heaven and earth and all creatures and so governs them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, yea, all things come to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. This is providence. And so God's providence means that he is in control of all things. And what that means specifically is a number of very, very keen particulars. So, number one, God controls all the good. God controls all the good. What does James 1.17 say? Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. God controls all the good. God causes his sun to shine and his rain to fall on the wicked and evil or wicked and evil and righteous and good alike. Okay? God is in control of all the good. What else does God control? God controls all the bad. God controls all the bad. In, in Acts 2.23, Peter says that Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. The most wicked event in all of human history was under the plan and foreknowledge of God to bring about the salvation of all who believe. And the fact that God was over it and the fact that God planned it didn't take away from the wickedness of the humans that perpetrated it, but it shows that God is in control of all the good, God is in control of all the bad, and thirdly, God turns the bad into good. God turns the bad into good. In Genesis 50 and verse 20, is Joseph, who had been betrayed by his brothers, is speaking to them for the first time in years. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. God turns the bad into the good. So he controls all the good. He controls all the bad. He turns the bad into the good, but he's often mysterious. God's providence is often mysterious. You know the words of Isaiah 55 and verse 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. He, now, just imagine, oftentimes we get frustrated because a turn of events has gone this way and we didn't expect it, or this thing has happened and it was hurtful or painful to me, or, or this took place and I didn't like it, and we think, we think, why? And I want an accounting from the Lord. But imagine if the Lord, imagine, imagine you trying to take one decision in your life, one decision that doesn't just impact you, but it, but it impacts your family, it impacts your work, a couple of friends, one decision that impacts you, and it impacts them, and then they impact other people, and it's like ripples on a pond going out. And if you try to forecast ahead a week the ramifications of one altered decision in your life, it would make your head spin. There would just be too many iterations. But then I shake my fist at God when he takes that one decision and every single other decision of every single other person on earth and he's able to forecast all the impacts out to eternity and I demand of him an accounting, you explain to me why this happened. And if he began to explain it to me, I wouldn't have half a clue what he was saying. But I become frustrated as though the piece of the puzzle that I see is the whole thing. And so God's ways are to me mysterious, and they must be mysterious, because he couldn't possibly explain to my finite mind all the implications of the one tweak that he's made to my plan for the day, and by golly, you changed my plan. And so God controls all the good, God controls all the bad, God turns the bad into the good, God is often mysterious, and God does not explain himself. Listen to how he answers Job after Job had spent, had spent a long time in essence, demanding of God, you better explain yourself for this dark providence in my life. And the Lord says, shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Dress for action like a man, and I will question you. And you, you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory 
and splendor. The Lord didn't answer Job. The Lord simply said to Job, I don't owe you an answer because you couldn't understand it if I told you, and you're not like me, and I'm not a man that you should contend with me. I'm the Lord. So why did the Lord say no? That question might never be answered, and he might say no to something that you've planned that is in and of itself a good thing, and yet the answer is still no. You see, we, we're called to trust and love and follow the Lord, not because you're always going to understand what he does or why he does it, but rather we trust and love and follow the Lord because of what he has done for us. You know this, Romans 5 and verse 8 says that God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Lord has demonstrated his love and care for you. And, and Romans 8 follows up, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? You see, you may not know the plans of your God. You may not understand the mind of your God. You may not follow the thoughts of your God. You may not agree with the providences of your God. But surely you know the character of your God. So we don't always have the explanation that we want, but we have enough evidence to know that the one who is asking us to trust is trustworthy. You may not know what he's doing or why he's doing it, but you know he is good. You know that he's given his son for you. You know that he's trustworthy. You know his character. You don't always know his actions or his inactions. You cannot always point and say, I know exactly why God did this or why he didn't do that or why he allowed this to happen, but I know him. I know him. I know his character and he is good. But how do you identify when he says no in your life? Practically, how do you identify when he's saying no? I think that there are four things that we can look to. Firstly, your circumstances. Maybe it's something as simple as a red light. Circumstances prevent you from doing what you had planned to do, and you can receive those as the Lord's providence. Is God actually in control of the traffic on 141? Yes. Is he actually in control of the lights? Yes. Okay, so you can take even something as simple as a red light as a circumstance that God controls. But not only circumstances, secondly, your conscience. If your conscience is not at peace with something that you're planning to do, then that's God's way sometimes of saying, no, I don't want you to do that. Even as Martin Luther said, to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. And Luther was right. And sometimes your conscience will prevent you. Sometimes circumstances will prevent you. Sometimes your community will be God's way of saying no to you. You have friends and family who see you in ways that you do not see yourself. And sometimes their counsel is his counsel in disguise. Their counsel is his counsel through human voices. And so through circumstances, through conscience, through community, and then lastly through communion with God in prayer, Sometimes God says no in a way that you can only define by prayer because Galatians 5.25 says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And the Spirit himself will in some way, shape, or form convince you that the answer is no. So how did the Lord guide Paul and his companions? Well, firstly, he said no. His guidance consisted of saying, no, I don't want you to go to the Southwest. No, I don't want you to go to the Upper Midwest. No, I'm going to trap you in Portland. Just sit there now. His answer was no. But then he also said, go. He didn't just say no. He said, go. Look at verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. They're on the coast. They're forbidden the further evangelization of uh, Turkey or of Asia Minor, and they receive a vision. Now, you know that Paul is a prophet, and the pattern for prophetic communication is laid out very early on in the Bible in Numbers chapter 12. The Lord said, if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. This is exactly what the Lord has promised to do. So the Lord is the source of the vision. And what did Paul see? He saw a man of Macedonia. Macedonia is just north of Greece. It's across the Aegean Sea from Turkey. But here's the big point. It's on a different continent. They're on the continent of Asia. And the gospel has gone to the continent of Asia. And the man of Macedonia is standing on the continent of Europe. And Paul sees this vision of a man saying, you have to come here and you have to help us. And you might wonder, well, what type of help do they need? But verse 10 answers it. 
Verse 10 answers that when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to what? To preach the gospel to them. Not they need our help in that uh, we're going to go there and we're going to help rebuild a building that had fallen down, or not we're going to go there and we're going to share our agricultural practices with them. We're going to go there and we're going to preach the gospel to them. Because what did the man of Macedonia actually need? What did all the people in Macedonia need? They needed salvation. Even as the choir sang, they needed the ability to survey the wondrous cross and to know that the Prince of Glory hung on the wondrous cross for their sin and for their salvation. They needed to. And so in verse 10, when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia. It's interesting because right there, the narrative switches from third person, they were doing this, that, and the other thing, to first person, we, because in all likelihood, Luke joined them at Troas. And so now we, he's a part of the group, have concluded that we need to go preach the gospel in Macedonia. And that word for concluded is a word that describes the process of collecting and evaluating lines of evidence to reach a decision about a course of action. And so Luke says, we've reviewed the evidence and we are convinced that God is saying, go. Go. Go over to Macedonia. Go to a new continent. Go preach the gospel there. So how did the Lord guide Paul and his companions? Well, firstly, he said no, but then, but then he said go. I was on a, a website a couple of weeks ago, and it was a website of people who are currently serving in missions, who are, in essence, encouraged to give a, a, a paragraph testimony of how the Lord called them into missions. And some of them are pretty fantastical, and some of them you might kind of go, wow. That really seems very circumstantial, and you took it as God's will in your life. And th- but there was one that I thought was fascinating. It was a young man explaining how, how he was in his car one day when suddenly he was struck by the thought of hundreds of millions of Chinese people marching lockstep toward their destruction because they don't know Jesus. It was just a vision in his head, a thought that he had, an image that for, for some reason took hold of him, and he knew that he had to go. He just knew that he had to be the one to go tell those millions of Chinese about Jesus. Now, I think in a general way, the Bible brings various lines of evidence together to say to every Christian, go. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.13, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. In other words, to have faith in Christ and not to talk about it, it just makes no sense biblically because because I have faith in Christ Jesus and because I know what He's done for me, I'm going to say something about it. I'm going to say stuff to people about Jesus on purpose. The destination might be your own neighborhood or it might be another continent, but we're all called to the mission of the Great Commission. We're all called to be those who believe and therefore we follow through and speak. But what of a particular work? What about a particular calling to a particular people or a particular ministry in a particular place? How would you know that the Lord is telling you to go particularly? It would be nice if you received a vision of a man of Macedonia saying, you got to come here. But maybe that's not going to happen for you. The God, the Holy Spirit, still guides people today, and it might not be through a vision, but surely He is able to convince you when He tells you to go. What would it look like? How does God say, go, today? Well, I think it consists of two parts. There's an inward call and an outward call. An inward call and an outward call. The inward call goes like this. It's the inward conviction of the Holy Spirit in you that says, I am supposed to go there. I am supposed to engage in that ministry. I am supposed to address that people group. I am supposed to do this particular thing. And it's usually a process that develops over time, and it often goes something like this. You can't get it out of your mind. You you can't get that particular calling, that particular people group, that particular mission out of your mind. It just won't go away your conversations seem to come back around to that. Even though you're not directing them that way, it just, it just seems to come up again and again. You, you find yourself imagining being there and doing that work and serving that people. You're restless with the idea, increasingly restless, of not going. 
You're compelled as you look at your own gifts, your own experiences, your own talents, your own education to say, most people couldn't do that, but God has uniquely prepared me to do it. And a dozen people could do what I'm doing here, but I think I'm the only person who could do that there. You can't imagine those people not hearing the gospel, and you can't imagine them not hearing it from you. You're drawn to the culture. You're drawn to the history. You're drawn to the language. You're drawn to the setting. You look soberly at the sacrifices that are required, and you're able soberly to look at them and say in your heart, those are, those are worth it. And it all leads you to this inward conclusion, the many lines of evidence to say, God is calling me to that. And so there's an inward call in which the Holy Spirit is convincing you through these lines of evidence that He's calling you to do that, but, it, but it's also matched by an outward call. And the outward call is the conviction of the Holy Spirit that is given to the church to agree with your inward sense of calling. The outward call is the conviction of the Holy Spirit that is given to the church body to agree with your particular inward sense of calling. And you see that in Scripture in Acts chapter 13 and verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, He said to the whole church, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. You see, they heard this audibly through the mouths of prophets, but still the Holy Spirit is the one who chooses. The Holy Spirit is the one who calls. The Holy Spirit is the one who sends. And the same Holy Spirit who gives you personally an inward sense of call should also then give the same call outwardly to the church so that they can corroborate it, so that they can share in your conviction that you're called there, so that the church can say, yes, we see in you. We see in you the gifts. We see in you the passion. We see in you the things that are necessary for this call. It's a good fit. Therefore, we also say, go. And that outward call from the church is necessary. It's absolutely necessary for two reasons. The first of which is this. The heart is deceitful above all things. Now, I've had the experience of sitting down across from a man, face to face across the table, who believed in the inward call sense, that he was called to a teaching ministry within the church, and I knew for a fact he couldn't teach his way out of a wet paper bag. He simply was not gifted with teaching. But he had managed through, through some way to convince himself that God was calling him to do that. And so we need the outward call of the church to come along and say, yes, your sense of the inward call is right. But you also need it for the, for the other reason, not simply to, to tell a person, no, you've, you've mistaken a personal desire for the call of the Lord, but also for somebody who, who is not confident in that sense of inner, inward call. I mean, just, just imagine a young woman who is uncertain of her calling, unsure that she has the gifts or abilities to go do what God is clearly calling, you to, calling her to do. And then the church comes along and says, are you kidding me? You are the perfect fit for this ministry, and it's so clear to the rest of us that God is calling you to do this, that you should take this as an outward confirmation of your inward call so that, so that you give her the courage to go forth and to step out into that call and obey the call of God on her life by virtue of the outward call of the congregation. So, of course, we just, quote-unquote, finished a month of missions, but the Great Commission is never finished, not until the return of Christ. And during this month of missions, you learn that two couples from our, our church, the Robies and the Quins, are being called to go. And that's happened in part because they have prayed and they have asked God a simple question, where and how do you want me to serve you? Where and how do you want me to serve you? Are you praying that? It's, it's a prayer that takes some courage. It's a prayer that takes an enormous amount of confidence in the Lord. Do you have the courage to pray it and to keep praying it and to consider that the answer might be something completely unexpected? Are you willing simply to say, Lord, my life and all my gifts and everything I have is only and always yours and I will do what you say? And then to have confidence that where the Holy Spirit calls, He also equips where he guides, he then also gives the gifts that are necessary to follow. 
Not everyone is called to go to another continent, but every Christian is called to go to the lost with the gospel because only Christ grants what the men of Macedonia need. See, only Christ offers salvation to Macedonians and to Mexicans. It's only Christ who offers reconciliation to South Africans and to the Senegalese. It's it's only Christ who holds out everlasting life to Armenians and Americans alike. It doesn't matter the culture, and it doesn't matter the nation, and it doesn't matter the people group, and it doesn't matter the language, and it doesn't matter if it was 100 years ago or 100 years from now. All human beings need the same thing. They need Christ Jesus. And you possess the words of eternal life. Ask God to lead and guide you, even to say to you, no, and then to say to you, go, and trust that he will be with you. How did the Lord guide Paul and his companions? Well, he said no, and he said go. If you want to summarize it, he guided them faithfully, and you could and should have every confidence that he will guide you faithfully as well. I confess to you that I still hate red lights, but more and more in the providence of God, I am less and less complaining about them because I see them as a part of God's providential guidance. Are you seeking the Lord? Are you asking Him to guide you? Are you asking Him? Because sometimes He says no, and sometimes He says go, and by this This double guidance, he will guide you as well as you seek faithfully to serve Christ as he calls you wherever, wherever he might lead you. Will you please pray with me? Our gracious God and Father, we thank you that your guidance of us is so sure, and we pray that you would grant us the courage to ask you for that guidance, to be open before you and willing to respond as you lead. We recognize your double guidance, how there are times when you say no and times when you say go. Help us to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit and to be obedient as we are led. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.